I only have six slides. They are designed to try to cheer you up at the end of the day. Um, this, this one, this one may not. And of course there are other influences on us. Not just our genes, not just our families, but the kind of school we went to. Um, me and Shaisa went to the same school. I think we both think we're very lucky to have gone to that school. Um, it wasn't a school that was so hard that it might make you brittle and tough and vicious to get through. Uh, I am, of course, thinking of Eton rather than the bottom end school in Oxford uh, for that. But everything affects you. Okay. This is my summary for you of what happened on uh, December the 12th. There are 66 million people in this country. So let's just allocate them by the nearest million. Uh, now, that does involve some approximation. And I'm going to divide them by age group. There are 66 million who are age six or below. And we know exactly what they did in the election, right? None of them voted. There are another six million aged seven to 14. Uh, one square is colored black to represent the fact that even if we were going to allow them to vote, because about a million children are not UK citizens, they wouldn't have been allowed to anyway. The third row down, 15 to 22 year olds, a block of them are too young to vote. If they did vote, two million of them voted Labour, this is to the nearest million, but three million of them didn't vote. The next block, 23 to 28 year olds, two million vote Labour. I've lumped all the Greens and Clyde Cymru together, I'm afraid there aren't that many of you. Um, and I put them, at least I'm making you young, 23 to 28, and then again, three million don't vote. Uh, this uses the survey data, we don't just make this up. Um, 29 to 35 year olds, 2 million Labour, around about a million can't vote because they are mostly EU but not UK citizens, that's the black square, 2 million don't vote, finally you begin to get your Liberals. Uh, there's 4 million of you, uh, if you add that on to the Labour, 10 million you get 14. If we go down again, I've put the SNP all together in one age group, and then not until you get to 43 do you begin to get the Tory voters in enough numbers to get you a block of a million. Now this is quite interesting. It's quite new, it's a new cleavage. It's a cleavage mainly by age and a little bit by wealth. Who isn't paying for housing? Who owns a house outright? Um, and you know other things like patronism and so on, but it's certainly not a cleavage by compassion. There isn't something that happened that made all the old people in the country uncompassionate and made the young people terribly woke and, you know, caring, right? That's what it is. To my mind, it's not too bad. There's 20 million people choosing not to vote or not mentioning to vote who could mention to vote. There's only 14 million Conservatives. Uh, there's 12 million children, 10 million Labour, 4 million Liberals, just get 11 seats for the way things work. <coughs> 3 million who are not UK citizens, a million in Northern Ireland, you get a lot of seats. Um, and so on and so on and so on. So it's an image. That is the thing that probably for most of you in the room made you quite upset on December the 13th. And elections do matter, and politics do matter, but they don't matter as much as you might think. Uh, I'm gonna show you of these kind of graphs. This is a graph of the rate of segregation in the vote. Uh, so we're always doing segregation graphs of ethnic minority groups. How segregated is ethnic minority group? All of the <coughs> people are clustering together, that's terrible. The most segregated group in Britain are university students. The next most segregated are rich people. So they tend not to live near poor people. But you can work out the segregation index for any group. This is the segregation index for Tory voters. It was probably high in the 1920s. It comes down in the 40s and 50s. Little jolt, if you're really nerdy, that's 1974, <coughs> February, 1974, October, two elections. And then the rise and rise and rise. The country becomes more segregated geographically. And the last dot there is 2015, 2015 election. I haven't bothered to update it because my message is the immediate isn't quite as important as you think. But in 2017, it came down. For the first time, the segregation came down. I publish that because you're all a bit joyous, you go, oh look, 
Not only has Corbyn stopped Theresa May forming a government, but for the first time in decades, we're beginning to see a reduction in the polarisation of voting. <coughs> and of course, this election, dramatic reduction in the geographical polarisation of voting. But it's changing down again. Each of those thoughts is a general election. There are trends and things that change more slowly than individual elections. Most elections don't actually matter, in hindsight. Um, this is inequality in health. Uh, it's uh, gaps between the worst off 10 and the best off 10 for the population, or 30%. It was very high in the past. Focus of the sessions made it, that was the recession in the 30s that increased unemployment in health because the normal was absolutely shattered. But generally goes down, goes up again, is teetering. It's two different methods. It's a U shaped curve. Another one, in case you're doubting me, the one that matters most to me because I study inequality. This is the take of the top 1% before tax and after tax. Incredibly unequal country, becomes more and more and more equal. What was around in the 1970s? <coughs> Blame Callahan, by the way, if you want somebody to have a go at, but it wasn't entirely Callahan. And then the 1% take more and more. It happened before 79. And again, we may be at a peak. Almost none, almost certainly, actually, none of those elections actually mattered for that. It was a general change. This was the First World War, the Russian Revolution. Trade unions getting active, suffragettes getting active. We didn't even realize until 1939 that half our inequality had gone. By the 1960s, we just about noticed that nobody had servants anymore. Okay? Changes, apart from that judge who said, is this a book you'd like your wife and servants to read? Because he hadn't quite cottoned on. We have servants again. There were slow run changes that occur in societies. One-off individual elections don't appear to change it. 1997, tragically, was the election which just doesn't show up on my graphs, if it never happened. Um, <laughs> which is why you do have to care. Only one more slide after this. Countries vary, vary usually. This is the USA, the UK, Sweden and Finland. All incredibly unequal in the past, way back to 1920. Uh, Sweden was actually the most unequal. Then, everywhere becomes more equal uh, until you get to a situation here. So, my child, I'm not shy because she's, she's there. Um, I grew up in a country which was almost as equal as Sweden. It was the second most equitable large country in Europe, apart from Sweden. It was Scandinavian. And then you get that divergence. But the thing is wobbling around at the top. It doesn't actually necessarily matter who is in. There's a zeitgeist that change and an attitude that changes. There were conservative governments in the 1950s who built more council houses than the Labour government before them. And we've had Labour governments who have increased inequality and allowed the 1% to take more and more and introduced the beginnings of privatisation into the National Health Service. And the first academy schools, right, well be well meaning. We've got a lovely new building in Oxford, and then bang, every secondary school that the state used to control in this county is now an academy school. The slow rise to greater compassion, more equality, and then the slow rise to less compassion, less compassion greater inequality. Uh, Compassion in Politics is, is doing a book and they very kindly let me write a chapter on economists um, because we have studies of economists. Uh, apologies to economists in the room uh, but there's now been three of these studies separately uh, which shows that people on average who are less compassionate are more likely to want to go and do economics at university. <laughs> Amongst economic students, those who are more compassionate are more likely to drop out of economics before finishing their degree. And those who are particularly lacking in compassion are most likely to go on and do a PhD. <laughs> now, it's not their fault. This is just how we come. But if you move your social policies within this country to say the economists are the most important people in all the government departments, it automatically has an effect of channeling people with less compassion up to the top. And it's partly about recognising that. It takes time. If you can read a little text here, 
Some of these things I think are obvious. If I'm not going to stand here and tell you, if you just ran the world my way, everything would be okay. Um, because that's stupid. How on earth could I know how to run the world? There's only one of me. There's only so much I can read. We do it collectively. It gets better collectively. The reason why the Scandinavian countries are in such a good state. A couple of years ago, Finland reported the lowest infant mortality in human history ever in the world. 97 babies in one year. And they were still worried about those babies. The reason why those countries are in a good state is people working together in the 40s, 50s, particularly the 60s and the 70s. Changing their education system so that everybody in Finland gets to go to the kind of school me and tries to kind of did. And then another generation on, when those school children who have been educated together get old enough to be in power, that's when you have five women running the country as you do have in Finland, four of them in their 30s. It takes time. You cannot, we do not have any examples of successful fast revolutions. Um, it, it takes time, it's an effort, it's a slog. I'm going to lift you up before you can ask a couple of questions on good news. Now there's constant good news, uh, but I decided to show these slides because of something that came out this morning, but I'll start off with this one. Uh, this came out on the 6th of January from the High Pay Centre. And the story was that the average top boss, by 5 o'clock on the 6th of January, they'd received in pay this year what the average worker gets in the whole year. Terrible, evil, and so on. Now, you may just think I'm particularly nerdy or odd, but that didn't excite me because that's what I like last year. <laughs> and you have to go down a bit and down a bit more. They're getting £900 an hour. That's what the CEOs of top books and firms get, £900 an hour. I thought, great, that's brilliant. Because the year before, they'd been getting over £1,000 an hour. What we actually discovered on the 6th of January this year is the biggest fall in the pay of chief executives in this country since the 1960s had just occurred. But you have to look out for these things. It may be a wobble, there may be a change. It's really expensive being this unequal. It's, it actually costs more. It's really expensive having people on the streets of Oxford. The, the total cost is more of what happens when you allow that to occur. Finland <coughs> is a poor country. Finland hasn't got rid of almost all its homelessness by using its wealth, and it hasn't done it just because they're nice. It's more efficient not to have people sleeping rough on the streets but they've worked out how to do it, whereas we tend to not care, just as we don't care about the infant mortality rate, which has been rising for the last four years in this country. The last bit of good news is very local and very trivial and not terribly important in a way, but we are in Somerville. Um, this is a proportion of students, undergraduate students at the University of Oxford who goes to state schools. And way back in the 1920s or 30s, it was below one in 10. It then kind of goes up as we become more equal in the 30s and 40s. Uh, tragically, Mrs. Thatcher was part of that. She was state school. She came here during the war. Then goes down. Uh, then a huge rise in the 1960s. 1960s was the biggest opening up at the University of Oxford. Then down a bit. Then up and up and up to 62.4% last year. And this year, the figure released this year, 69. Oh. Biggest jump ever in state school entry in the University of Oxford. By the time they get their A-levels, it will probably be 67, because we've taken some punts <laughs> on some kids who might not quite get it. Um, but all the time when you're sitting there wallowing, thinking this terrible, and that man's on telly and he's running our country, and we're not even decrying the Americans assassinating a general, where what worries me is the man who was actually driving that car. Nobody said it. The general wasn't sitting on the back seat on his own. Well, there was another general from Iraq, but there were a whole load of other people. But all the time you're watching that news and thinking everything is awful, hundreds and thousands of progressive things are going on through an enormous amount of effort. The University of Oxford did not get to 69% state entry this morning from not trying. It was a huge amount of effort by a whole set of people in these buildings to try to change things because they were embarrassed by what we are. 
and by what we have produced. There comes a point when you produce too many prime ministers <laughs> who are not good prime ministers. My department, it's not just the one we produce, we also produce the woman who started the Brexit party last year. We only take 75 students a year, right? And it's, it's just kind of funny, and I don't, I don't even mean to, but, you know, part of why this has happened, but it also happened because, well, accidents, or maybe deliberate, but, you know, Storm's <coughs> offering to give us some money, and then the only letter I've ever known the University of Oxford to lose, being his letter, and that becoming the national news story just before the interviews a couple of years ago, William. That's the kind of things it takes. There are good things happening out there. There is a general shift. Younger people know the planet is burning. They know we're going to put them in enormous debt. They know they're going to have to rent for the rest of their life. That's stacking through. Older people, I think, are scared and worried about their grandchildren, ironically, and think they can save their grandchildren from hordes of competing immigrants coming in or some strange <laughs> other thing. Right? It's a depressing split country. It's the most economically unequal country in Europe. We have some of the worst educational records, and by that I mean inability of people at the top as well. This isn't about the poor. The kind of good news, although not brilliant good news for you, is when you're ever in that situation, actually things almost always get better because it's so hard to sustain the level of stupidity you've, you've currently got. Um, but the more serious thing, the more, the more serious thing to end on. Although, if you need hope, you know, I do get annoyed with people being depressed because, not in general, I completely understand it. If I was sitting in Scandinavia trying to work out what to do next, I might get depressed because they have fascists in Scandinavia, they have immigration, they have problems, and how on earth do you carry? And they've got a very elderly population. And how on earth do you carry on providing such good care? That's difficult. How do you? How do you keep your position in the OECD league table of the most successful countries on the planet when you're doing so well, as opposed to where we are? Where, to be honest, you know, almost at random it'll get better, but you need to do more. <laughs> but you, you need, I don't know, we are in an awful situation. Um, but you need the effort to do it. The good things that have happened have happened by lots and lots of unsung work. And this is the interesting thing. I think by people acting compassionately and not often getting much recognition for the work they do because they do it quietly. Up against that, you have a small number of incredibly uncompassionate people with completely or almost completely lacking empathy who look down on the mass of humanity and see them as scum that need to be managed who are driven and work very, very hard to make things worse when they think they're making it better. That's what you're up against. That occurs everywhere. Those places, countries and times where you control the selfish and the non-empathetic obsessed, those places do well, just as we did well in the 1960s and 70s and not the early 80s. Those places where they take control, where they hold control, they become more stupid, more individualistic. And it's harder to get out of the rut, which is why you see these rises up of Americans accepting that 1% of them can have a quarter of all wealth, that they can have 2 million people in their prisons, and that they can regularly watch people die on the streets. And in the poorest towns, about 1 in 12 Black American women can expect to be evicted every year, and that becomes normal. It's the way in which a lack of compassion feeds on to a lack of compassion. But be optimistic about the good things that are happening. You're going to have to hold on to them, and they will happen. Watch for the next line in 10 seconds on this. Well, he's looking at me. Watch over the next year how all those 27 countries, all of which are more equitable than us, some of which are the most equitable countries on earth, almost all of which, their children and young adults are better at problem solving numeracy and certainly literacy, in other words, they can speak more than one language, 
Watch how those 27 countries, I suspect, can passionately deal with us because they have the whip hand. Um, and take part in applauding what goes on rather than seeing them being presented as the next great enemy after the last enemy. It's going to be a fight and a battle. It's always a fight and a battle. But it doesn't have to be something where you think inevitably you're almost going to fail. Economic inequality is currently falling in the majority of OECD countries. Infant mortality worldwide is falling faster than it ever has done in the history of the species. There are loads and loads of good news stories. You need them to keep you going. And you particularly need them because compassionate people don't tend to be quite as driven as people who lack compassion, apart from a few. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm told just two questions, if they're short, and I am. Any quick one? Yes. Uh, yes, can compassion be taught at school? Uh, yes, and I'm sorry, I'm obsessed with Finland because I've been working on it for the last two years. Uh, in Finland, uh, they don't necessarily call it compassion, but they include a whole set of things in their school curriculum, uh, which includes spotting when the press are lying to you. They teach children, which might not be unrelated to the fact that they score first for the best quality press in the world. Um, you can certainly teach these things in school, and you can also teach selfishness. You, you can have campaigns that say, let's all create our smooth startup businesses and do well. Or you can give children guns in school and line them up and call it the Eton Rifles. Um, we, our schools can have a huge effect on how our children come out. But we will always have a small minority who are greedy and about 80% of people who are pro-social and a small minority of pro-social people who cannot help themselves but be overtly compassionate. That's how human beings come. Uh, but we can modify the circumstances into which uh, they go through. One last question. Lady there. It's not so interesting. And I uh, in Hayes Valley, which means up the road we've got Ipswich. Yes. <laughs> um, and there was a lot of support for Ali Malani, uh, yes. the uh, former Joe and Labour candidate. Uh, <coughs> All the meetings were absolutely squashed in mm. pink rooms with the support for it. And generally, going around up street, the previous um, Tory MP, Sir John Randall, was very well respected because he was a hard-working, local man. Mm. He would have open surgeries. He would not leave until the last person was yeah. seen. He would always get a letter two or three weeks after highlighting the issue, what he'd done, what, what, mm. what was sponsored. Whereas Boris, you have to make an appointment to see him and mm. rarely there. Is it there for his odd photo opportunity? Yeah. So, so it's how did he win? So, so, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'll repeat the question. Uh, okay, the, the question is about Uxbridge, which if you didn't know is Boris Johnson's constituency, uh, where Boris's Johnson Boris Johnson's majority wasn't huge and the local Labour new candidate was uh, very charismatic, young, good, and had a lot of local support. Why didn't he not get anywhere? Uh, we, we make a mistake from judging from what we see around us and extrapolating it. Uh, so you can have party rallies of two, three, four thousand people when the leader goes around the country. It means absolutely nothing uh, when it comes uh, to votes, sadly. Uh, that's, that's part of the reason. If you want my nutshell answer on, on, on this, after the result in June 2017, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party suddenly went from being a joke, which was going to self-implode, with the majority of MPs voting against the leader, to a real threat. The threat was explicit. Uh, the threat was, we will increase public, public spending levels on health and education and so on, to a level just below Germany's. Uh, you'd have to do it twice again to get to Scandinavia a level just below Germany. Now what wasn't said but was obvious to people in the top 5% or 10% is if you are going to fund a health service at the level of Germany, which spends a billion more a week, forget 350 million, a billion more a week, 
you're going to have to tax people at the top and they were not able to go skiing and they can't go on holiday to the Caribbean and they can't find a holiday house in Wales and they can't send their children to private schools because they won't have the cash to do it. And so between June 2017 and the election, those in that group, which of course includes all BBC presenters because they all get booted for free in case you didn't know, and they don't send their children to the local school in London, but if they're really good they can kind of pretend they do, that group of people in Britain decided that this was beyond the pale. And the attacks were from across the board, of which The Guardian was by far the most effective in attacking Labour. Because it was really upset the people at the top of The Guardian, who are very lovely. But you know, the salaries are over 150,000 if you're at the top of The Guardian. Uh, and that, I think, in hindsight, not obvious at the time, uh, was what went on. And so the good people of Uxbridge uh, most of whom would have not been met by the, the Labour candidate, were fed information through the media that said that you've got a choice between somebody firm, solid and British and something completely dangerous that you really don't want to do. Where I have hope is that when you look at the age distribution, that message could work for people who were older. It didn't work for people who were younger. So, so it becomes harder. Yeah. Oh, and, and a huge number of people won't vote. Um, bothering to vote, voting is a religious thing, it's like praying. You know, your own individual vote isn't going to swing it, uh, but, it but it's good to do. Uh, vote, voting rates are higher in countries that are more compassionate and more equal. They're lowest in the United States of America, only half of Americans vote. This is, we are collective, human beings are only human beings through other human beings. Right? And when the collective is working well, we are happier. And when it doesn't work well, we fight for ourselves and we become nasty and we become vicious and we look for the outsider and we blame them and at the extreme we put them into camps. And that's what we are. Thank you very much. Thank you.